Discog Graffiti, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on the monks, along with our very special guest, king of banjo ambient drift, Andrew Tuttle. And if you're tuning in for the first time, I'm over a year into the creation of this show, which has now grown to three shows a week. And there's a real audience building. Six-figure downloads in 70 countries, consistently ranked in the top 30 music commentary podcasts. And so now I'm in free fall mode on a serious mission. I've quit my job as a hearing instrument specialist. And if you're listening to this episode close to its premiere date, then my wife, myself, and our four-year-old are right in the midst of driving across the frozen tundra that is currently America to the East Coast so we can live frugally and manageably. And all of that, just to ensure that Discography is the standard bearer for all that's awesome about music. So don't go anywhere when this episode's done. Subscribe. Coming up, we have a soul-bearing interview with Foxygen's Jonathan Rado, episode one of the John Landis tapes, Sergio Diaz from Os Mutantes rating his own early work, plus episode one of We Are Stardust, We Are Over, Woodstock opening act Sweetwater, and on and on and on way into the future. And all of this while we're plowing 3,000 miles through the snow, just so you can rock on uninterrupted in the style to which you become accustomed. Hey guys, throw me a bone here. I need your help. Check out all the back episodes and share the ones you dig with your friends. Go ahead and tag me too. Also, join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter, too, in case you don't mess with the Zuck. Also, please rate the podcast five stars only, along with a beautifully worded review, especially if you're listening to the show on good old Amazon Music or Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else for that matter. It'll help a lot. You can find the link to our legendary playlist in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. And if you're like me and enough's just never enough, then visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Our Patreon feed is the ultimate music deep dive. I post three shows a week. The main show on Sunday, Discography is the private press with Paul Major on Tuesdays, which is soon to be a television show this year, and a Thursday wildcard episode, which is either an interview with that week's guest or one of our other offshoot shows like Rock Cousteau and Queasy Listening. So hey, try it for a month, you've got nothing to lose. Okay, back to business. First things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. Even the bad stuff. We're not just covering albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all the real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. And away we go then with Andrew Tuttle as we scale the unforgiving, albeit quickly trodden terrain that is Mount Monks uncompromising in waters that had yet even to be recognized or tested turned pop thirsty beyond belief a notion that in itself is the most insane thing of them all oh but wait oh but wait our guest today is the best kept secret of the australian underground a genial fade into the background presence whose work four excellent studio albums to date has evoked such depth of feeling, it veers straight to a place of pure possibility. This guy is a songwriter, composer, improviser, and artist in residence. His universe exists serenely and purposefully in a space where the five-string banjo and six-string acoustic guitar weave in and out of gaseous and ululating electronic clouds. And you can feel the effects deep, deep in the bowels of the scrotum of your heart. Yeah, sure, I love John Fahey as much as the rest of them and the best of them, but the experience that I had six months into the pandemic in August of 2020, as I lay on my sister's living room floor in the Vermont woods, surrounded also by my wife, one-year-old son, mom, 
Dad, and Andrew Tuttle's Alexandria album playing on the hi-fi, track one, Sun at Five in 4161, with tears streaming profusely down my face. And so the man responsible for driving another grown-ass man to tears halfway across the world is here with us today, quite luckily. And so, lads and ladies, the outstandingly impressive and totally unique Andrew Tuttle. Hey, it's so lovely to be chatting to you. It's really, I'm looking forward to doing some deep dive into some music and we'll see what feelings we can get at our various time zones by the end of this. I'll tell you, if you, first of all, this is a little, this is kind of a long time coming. I threw out a fishing line on Instagram and, <laughs> uh, and you bit, thank God, because, uh, you know, like I had just mentioned, the and, and this is another reason why, there's a couple of reasons why I'm not screaming in the intro uh, <laughs> uh, to convey pure musical passion. One is that it is four in the morning right now. I'm in a St. Louis hotel room, hunkered between two queen-sized beds with a blanket draped over me doing a <laughs> sort of off-the-radar episode. So I don't want to wake up the entire hotel. The other is there is a gentleness of purpose to what you do. And I feel like uh, Ambient in general has been in this uh, mass exodus to get away from soothing sounds, to get away from the new age uh, Muzak connotations. But you actually have this thing, Not it's not like you're courting Muzak, but you're not afraid of that traditional banner. It, it, that's what I get from your music. Am I right? Yes, yeah, totally. I yeah, absolutely. I think there's something really special about creating beauty. I think with kind of music in a similar world to myself, there's a lot of it I love, but I like to, I guess, part of where I live, I live in the subtropics. I live in a world where I'm quite fortunate to have a lot of sunshine going around and I like to listen to and make music that kind of is more major, major note than minor note approximately 60 seconds into my first conversation with you when we just shot the shit over uh you know over zoom i, I it was you're exactly the kind of per, the type of personality that i hope my son grows into so i have nothing to worry about a guy who you know gets all of the inclinations inside of him out into the world because you know this is your calling obviously but you have a day job and you love your day job you're not contentious with it there's not a rift inside of you that drives you nuts mm. maybe there is but i don't i don't get that <laughs> from you and uh, i'm really i'm in awe and i wish i was you <laughs> Look, we're chatting about this now, but we're also going to get into some pretty gnarly music as well. So I think it's a, it's good to get the balance at different times for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're skirting the question, which just leads me to believe that, yes, you are the perfect human being. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I love flattery. Let's just keep chatting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, like most of the people that I talk to, these are like you know these are tortured artists. You don't strike me as a tortured artist, a gleefully no. happy artist. Totally. So initially, you and I had a different artist that we were working on. I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, but I found that I wasn't connecting to the artist. So I shot a flare gun warning out to Australia that I know you love this guy. I'm giving all his stuff zeros. Is that cool? And you're like, yeah. let's find someone else. Initially, when you said the monks, I thought, well, that's uh, certainly very different than the music he makes. But of course, someday we'll find it. The banjo connection. <laughs> Is that what we're dealing with here? Uh, I think the banjo is kind of a secondary thing with the monks, to be honest. I'm just a really, I find the album really, like Black Monk Time really fascinating and the band really fascinating. Um, I've not really thought of it too much, which is really dumb because I, I own a five string banjo and I bought a six string band guitar recently. Um, so it's something that actually in the recent days I've been thinking, I could probably play this stuff, and or at least get the tone. When I thought of it, oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. But it's good to know that that was only sort of a trace element. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, it's the discography effect helping people find out more about themselves. It's it's good. We're ha we're a few minutes in, and I'm getting really, really deep. So you're saving some therapy lessons, um, <laughs> courses, so that's really good. Is this your favorite band? No, 
Uh, it's an album I love, um, yeah. and I I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about this particular band and this particular album because the, at least the first two thirds of the album I think are absolutely incredible. I'm not necessarily a like rock music guy, and I'm not necessarily like a '60s music guy by any means either. And I know that six, calling a decade a genre is really really lazy but it that, it makes sense um, in some circumstances so I really thought it'd be great to talk about this band and their discography in a kind of a different way because I guess the artists we'd originally talked about and also some other things I've been thinking about have these massive 15 album long discographies and that's amazing and it's really cool to um, talk about someone who, depending on what mood you're listening to, you'd be in the mood for any of their albums versus something like this where it's kind of one and done. And I think that's really yeah. fascinating as well. So, yeah, yeah I think it's definitely uh, yeah, not a favourite band, but one of my favourite albums of all time. And also the documentary, the Transatlantic Feedback, um, that's one of my favourite documentaries of all time as well if you've never heard of the monks or if you've never heard their music you're really in for a treat tonight if you totally. have it's an amazing story to revisit to get this uh, touched upon first you know as far as what they mean to me they're really an amazing comet across the night sky of music history these guys streaked across they were here then they were gone and you know frankly i spend way more time thinking about this than a, a grown-ass 50 year old man should but they honestly could be the true genesis of punk. Side by side with the Kinks, uh, you know, around the time of circa 1964, uh, there was punky attitudes, but there was not a lot of music that you could fairly say is conceivably the genesis of punk. And the Kinks had certainly the attitude, they had the gesture, the grand gesture of taking a razor blade to the amplifier to create more distortion. That act alone could be the genesis of punk, but the music itself, the lyrics, the sentiments, everything was farther along than the kinks were. If you really want to slice it down, uh, the monks were a clearer contender for the punk, for the seminal punk title, the original uh, punk moment. Totally. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's that it's before so much, you know, it's the genesis of so much music. And it's also, I, it's just out of the, you know, the kind of unfathomable ways that people come out with music. I just can't comprehend that this, you know, band of American GIs living and being peacetime soldiers in this tiny little army town in the middle of Germany come out with this absolutely brilliant and like transformative and provocative album. Yeah. And, and probably thinking no one's listening. No one can even understand us because we're totally. in Germany. Uh, and our noise is so, uh, you know, over the top that they probably won't even, even if they could speak English, they probably wouldn't be able to hear what we're saying. So we might mm. as well just go for it because no one will remember what we're doing. And here we are. Totally. And I think we'll chat about it throughout the episode. But it's the fact that it's yeah. kind of starting out just as a regular kind of 60s beat band and then just right. neck minute, just come out with this totally different thing as well. It's ridiculous. So now let's introduce the characters in today's episode. Gary Berger, lead guitar, lead vocalist. Larry Clark, Lawrence Spangler on organ, backing vocals, and piano. Eddie Shaw on bass guitar, backing vocals, trumpet, and brass instruments. Dave Day on banjo, rhythm guitar, banjo guitar, and backing vox. And Roger Johnston on drums and backing vox. So let's talk about their, their, their influence, their sound. You know, I would say probably the first uh, genre of music that seemed to take from, from this well or you know, borrow some elements was Kraut Rock, uh, or at least that's where I, he I heard it, unless it was a, a sort of an accident. But then punk, experimental, you know, there's a lot of bands like Dead Kennedys, Beastie Boys, White Stripes, and The Fall, who, you know, blatantly were influenced by them. There's a great 
descriptor. The recording artist Kelly Stoltz described the monks in 1996 uh, uh, as thus, at their worst, it is totally oddball freak rock that sounds like a pleasurable argument. I love that. <laughs> so good. Yeah. And I think a really big um, thing they kind of lent on is they were very kind of, I guess, existing separate too, but in, I guess, accidentally influencing garage rock as well. Like, I think that's a real kind of, there's a sound in that as well. Like, it's kind of almost like it's a, you know, a, a, you know kind of like proto nuggets kind of thing as well. Let's talk about the cherry on the cake, though, because they definitely became known for their eventual look. They mimicked the look of Catholic monks by wearing black habits with cinctures tied around their necks, and most importantly, their hair worn in partially shaved tonsures. Is that how you pronounce that? I, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, they all shaved their pates. And I mean, if you look at pictures of it, they look insane. They don't look like, oh, we're just gonna shave our heads. They were like, it's kind of like shaving your eyebrows. Once you do that, you are committed to the idea of shaving your eyebrows. Totally. And especially it's the thing, it's not like they were, you know, in their late 40s and deciding to get rid of a bit of hair. It's like people in their, what I, I would say, early mid 20s who are just, sh yeah, kind of just like shaving the top of their head and that's it. Like it was, it's very, like, it's almost, it's almost papal in a way. It's yeah, very, it, very it, fascinating. It, yeah, it certainly is. And it's probably the least likely hairstyle to get you girls, which in the early <laughs> totally. 20s, if you're in your early 20s doing that, it means you're really committed to your sound. Totally. And also the fact that you're doing all of this whilst you're in the army, like that's really fucking ballsy as well. Yeah. Just like, yeah, you've got like, I can't imagine that it has gone down well either. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, start into the section of the show that I affectionately uh, and maniacally as well like to call the run-up. This gets us in as quick a fashion as possible to release number one, although as Captain Tuttle has mentioned to you, we are uh, in a sort of one-and-done territory, although... These guys do have not just Black Monk time. There are other records. Uh, they yep. generally have the same songs or types of songs on it in different iterations. But let's, uh, let's dive in head first, though. The, the nucleus of the Monks was formed as, uh, as early as late 1963. American GIs who were overseas, they came together as a quintet known as the Turques. They first began performing at military hangouts near their outpost in Gelhausen. They played a combination of American rock and roll standards from the 50s and some originals that were, that were penned by Berger and Day to really rowdy crowds, probably drunk off their asses and servicemen. A talent manager named Hans Reich spotted the band, convinced the Turkeys to, to stay in Germany when their military careers had ended with the promise of some work as a band. So for a brief period, uh, the band had a vocalist named Zach Zachariah and a drummer named Bob Rose. Then Roger Johnston jumped in on drums after the other guy left. And henceforth, the lineup which would exist for the duration of the group's recording career was solidified. So as the Torques began to rehearse, Berger arranged a one-off single deal for the group at an independent studio in Heidelberg. Uh, the single was, uh, band originals There She Walks and Boys Are Boys. 500 copies were produced in late 1964 and Clark sold them at live shows. Yeah, I'm going to put this on the playlist uh, because it's still so great, even though it's clearly from a more innocent uh, and less raucous time in their career. Did you get to hear that, that single? I did. I guess it was interesting figuring out how and when to talk about each individual track because it's hard to know what tracks on tracks um, on different releases so there's the two tracks which are there's there she walks on this recording of boys are boys and then that they're on the five upstart americans compilation which is then a different compilation which is it's always interesting it's like the how many times can you package joy division or how many to kind of thing like that it's an interesting one because i mean there she walks i don't know whether we're ranking singles and things like that but i just had it kind of as a unremarkable pop song this version of boys are boys in terms of the single it sounds better than the the as a bonus song on a bonus album which is kind of weird so the songs were there but they were just being played i guess in that fashion 
being the talkies and playing, you know, you're playing covers at bars. So yeah. it's kind of, the, the songs are there, but I think it's kind of, it's there's, they haven't really had the time to find their feet yet. They're, they're pretty much just being a band who are playing music that won't get them beaten up at, um, you know, like rough bars. So yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. I don't know. What about yourself? I think it's a bomb without a wick inserted. So, mm. you know, the it's it's funny to me because they're trying to be sort of kind of normal, but they just mm. can't help but be weird. I mean, it's <laughs> totally. like it's not like they hadn't discovered that they were weird. It's like they mm. had a big gate up trying to keep the weirdness out. I am cognizant that that's there. It, unless I'm imagining it, it seems like <clears throat> let's hold all this other stuff at bay and focus on these two songs that we came up with. And I think all the performances are quite restrained in that sense as well. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like particularly like Gary Berger's vocals are very, like they're nothing like they would become later on. So it's yeah. it's kind of the, it's that thing where you'd see a band live and you'd pick up a copy of their single at a local gig. It's nothing that would indicate what would come in the future. Right. I think you're right though, it's just that, it's it's trying it's trying to hold themselves in a bit. They probably had no clue what they were capable of at this point. They just wanted to get something out there. But and like you had said, the recordings from the single were later collected on the compilation album Five Up Start Americans. You also had a um, another thing from around the same time that was yet another repackaging called Demo Tapes 1965. So I have now just spilled this Red Bull can three times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, that that give you an update about my life here. So so 1965, we have five upstart Americans and demo tapes. 1965, you know those were not releases that came out at the time, but those were later releases that you know collected and scraped up everything that they'd been working on in that time. So in early 65, the Torques began a residency at the Rio Bar in Stuttgart, where they utilized the space to experiment with electronics and sound ma manipulation, something Mr. Tuttle is no stranger to, <laughs> while also expanding their repertoire. So it was during the rehearsals at the Rio Bar that the, that the band's avant-garde style, which was a combination of abrasive waves of feedback and super loud distortion, began to emerge primitively. The band decided to rename themselves at this point the monks. Clark, whose dad was a priest, had some misgivings about the name, but they did go ahead with it. Phase one, before there was even a thing called punk, came a bunch of fucking punks, 1964 <laughs> to 1966. So under the supervision of uh, their new management team, the monks started conducting extensive rehearsals with a focus on gritty, rhythmically oriented music. In came the new instruments and hardware to achieve that goal. So the maestro fuzz box and eventually a wah-wah pedal for Berger, a floor tom for Johnston for that, you know, sort of primal Mo Tucker thing. Uh, this is pre-Mo Tucker, for God's sake, and a six-string six banjo for Day. The banjo specifically offered a disorienting counter rhythm to the bass section. So Shaw explained that the group's motivation was to possess high rhythm and high energy. Uh, he also said the idea of it was to get as much beat out of it as we could, as much bam, 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 bam on the beat or whatever. The only totally. time symbols would be used would be for accent. If anyone wasn't contributing towards rhythm, then it wasn't part of the monk sound. It, it, was, it was about a year of trial and error before the transformation was complete and the band was confident enough to return to the studio. So. In September 65, that's when the monks went into the studio and recorded new self penned compositions to present to Polydor Records. And I think I love this whole like talking about the year of extensive rehearsal. I really kind of do think it's the euphemism of a, a year of making a lot of music on uppers. Right. I don't know what exactly it was, whether it was some very, you know, some good Fritz Kohler or whether it was, you know, some trucker speed or whatever it was. They were definitely not sleeping for that year, I don't think. So that's just the way I'd, I'd always interpreted it. It's kind of a, let's go to this little bar, let's make music for eight hours. And I thought the Beatles in Hamburg kind of thing. It's just the, let's have a bunch of speed, let's make this music and get real tight. If you were to put them side by side, those two transformations, 
I don't, the Beatles were just, uh, you know, providing music. These guys, it seems like that they were hunkered down trying to find a sound that didn't exist yet, punk or garage or whatever you want to call it. And they were trying to find that sound. You know, we take it for granted that, that punk exists. You know, imagine, you know, you're trying to describe what something that, you know, eventually becomes this irrefutable totemic presence within music, but doesn't yet exist. To even have gotten there at all, especially, you know, all the way out in bumfuck Germany is kind of a miracle. I think you've got to push yourself to the limits to get something like that. And I feel like that's yeah. what kind of comes out of that. It's just this, all right, we're going in as this little beat band and we're coming out as like Satan kind of thing like that. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and even, you know, the recordings from this time, which came out on a release called the early years comp is actually way better than that designation would allow you to think it would be just because it's called the early years at least to me, this was, for this trawl, it was the first time I, that I had listened to this. Um, I had heard Black Monk time, you know, a, a million times, just not this stuff. Mm. Um, but the compilation went through plenty of re-release sneak attacks. It was first totally. released as Five Upstart Americans in 99, then reissued on LP and CD under the title Demo Tapes 1965 in 2007. Uh, as well as uh, the early years, 64, 65. So I, I kind of chose this to center upon in talking about this music. This was released on Light in the Attic. It actually chronicles the group's recordings as the five Torques up to their demo sessions as the monks in late 65. It's what they call nascent. Absolutely. So most of these songs are on Black Monk Time, uh, which came out in 66. And, and quite an interesting twist on the way that these songs later became performed they're not quite as tepid as that early single but they're obviously not quite as much of an explosion as black monk time it kind of hangs out in that middle zone you can see it's getting there i guess it's just the it feels like and i don't know the specifics but in terms of the recordings it's kind of a you know a microphone in the room rather than really focusing they're starting to focus on the the, the songs and but they weren't really thinking about the recording at that stage but I think it's a really interesting insight I think it's one where you wouldn't pick it up if that was the first thing you heard by the band but if you've heard the album I think it's a really fascinating you, insight to where in what um, from where they started to where they become I had a great experience listening to this because when I first threw it on to to start coming up with notes uh, my wife, Jen, is, you know, she's got great taste in music uh, or else we wouldn't be married. Um, but, uh, and probably she, not with me either. Uh, but I put this on and she, you know, typically will be like, oh, what the hell is this? You know, just kind of like, uh, kind of like me with boobs. Um, <laughs> and with this one, she, her, I could see her body language. She just like, mm. she got into the zone and she's like, who the hell is this? The tone of her voice was as if I had played her the incendiary completed versions. Mm. So I, I believe this is actually an amazingly great standalone album on its own. The reverb on the guitars placed the treatment of these tunes somewhere somewhere half between Shadows territory and proto-punk, Hank Marvin style stuff. Yeah, for sure. You know, Monk Time is great. The spoken word intro is not quite as much of a hammer on the head. That droning pre-Silver Apples single note organ shriek uh, is fantastic. It's amazing still with these early treatments that the songs were being done, you know, in as advanced a form as, as, as mm. these. It's interesting you mentioned the vocal intros. I found them to be... And it's kind of funny, I'm the one who suggests, you know, suggesting an idea than shitting on it. But it's just like, I, I found those intros to be so cheesy. Like, yep. they didn't have, yep. the, it didn't have the, didn't have the menace that, totally. that was laid out. It's a bit, it was a bit like, hey, here we go in this, Nancy, you know, so we're going to listen to the thing now, coming up next to the top 40 years, kind of this weird, like, goofy almost thing. And yeah. I'm sure it's one of those ones I'm sure would have been hilarious in the rehearsal. It was like a joke on tour, jokes on tour don't translate outside because they're not funny. But like in the room, it's hilarious. Like, yeah. I'm sure that was the funniest thing of all time um but yeah I've, I've, i think keep track, keep talking about the tracks but i think it's the um there's a couple of those early ones on in the in the release that it's a bit like guys come on just you can, you can cut that 10 seconds 
Yeah, I mean, it actually said in my notes uh, under mug time here, it says the spoken word intro threatens to spill over into Velveeta territory. So I agree completely. But, you know, the, the, the reason I'm actually bringing it up is, is because the intro to the released version is very different. We go from a, an almost like Vegas style, you know, insert cheesy epithet here yeah. to uh, like screaming about Vietnam. So, and that's within one year. What happened in that year, guys? Jen and I were listening to this thing, and let me just tell you, you know, we're we're a married couple. It's not like we're, uh, you know, you know, constantly making love in public, right? We're we're a married couple. We have a three year old. We're halfway through this record. We pulled off on the side of the road and made love in our car. Wow! So thank you, the monks, and thank you, Andrew Tuttle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I actually give this record four and a half stars. Wow, two and a half to three. You can't be blamed for that. I, I was ready to, you know, lob out a Frisbee of that size, but... Yeah, I, 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 totally, I totally get where you're coming from. I think it's that, I don't know why I did it this way, but I listened to this and then the album. I kind of did it chronologically. Maybe it was the... Yeah, me too. I, I, I like it. I mean, some difference is good. I think it's, it's on its way there, but I, I guess for me, I guess for better or for worse i'm coming at it yeah i guess it's an interesting one i'm just trying to think of the best what way to put it like what are you what are you grappling with you're grappling uh, with that. do you feel I'm grappling with that, that, you're, that you're dismissing it oh not at all like it's definitely not guilt it's just the kind of the like it's for me i think it goes back to what i mentioned a bit earlier about i'm not a fan of 60s rock music in general like, there's stuff that i love yeah, yeah. like there's you know things like velvet underground there's things that come out of that like the nico recordings and things like that but i I mentioned nuggets in the in the kind of the context of this, but like you know, I know it's kind of a matter of faux pas in some circles. But like listening to nuggets doesn't really do a great deal for me. And like I, a lot of the '60s canon, like it's not being contrary, and it's just I never really got it. So I think for this, it's a little bit like I don't listen to a lot of distorted music, but I guess because I love the album so much, for it to be a bit more jangly. Just as it just kind of feels a bit underdeveloped. It's it's almost like listening to another band cover the monks and cover monks. It's like yeah. it's like listening to a local band covering any songs from the first three Wipers albums. It's like listening to Jerry and the Pacemakers covering the monks. Yeah, I think it was that kind of two and a half to three. But I mean, that's still fifty to sixty percent out of a hundred. So that's it's, you know not too bad. I can't believe you hate it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, this is, it's fascinating to have somebody like you on the show. There, I don't even know if we've had somebody on yet who could give a rat's ass about the 60s. And it, it really is okay if that's how you feel about it. It's just, it's so funny because that is so very much the bag that I'm in. It's ever since I was a little kid, even if the song sucked, if it was psychedelically treated, I would uh, make exception for it. You know, I'm like 13 yeah, yeah. years old walking around with Traffic's Dear Mr. Fantasy and just anything where a band got it together in the country. I was all about that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So around this time is when they started dressing like freaks, that they started, you know, really beefing up their sound. In November 65, Polydor finally decided they were ready and willing to gamble on this new radical approach, and they entered into a studio. In March 1966, an album was released called Black Monk Time. Was it not? It was. Most likely, you're not going to discover this before you discover Velvet Underground and Nico, but it's uh, in a lot of ways just as important. Uh, it's really their their only album. It was uh, the only album released during the band's original incarnation, and uh, it's an incredibly important landmark in the development of garage and punk. Produced by Jimmy Bolin, the single to promote the album was Complication, backed with Oh How To Do Now. And like the album, it tanked. And also the recording sessions for the record brought the band to complete exhaustion because, you know, they were doing their early morning work in the studio, but every night they were performing alongside Bill Haley in the Comets, which is hysterical to think about. Bill Haley? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the fuck kind of a bill is that? <laughs> the songs, you know, they strayed very far from the typical verse, chorus, bridge, sort of a framework. A lot of Vietnam stuff, a lot of, you know, instead of love songs, hate songs. 
and a demonization in general towards society. Mm. It also did not come out in the U.S. It was considered too radical and non-commercial, so it was circulated on tape in the 1980s, and by the early 90s, it had developed a cult following. Tell me about your relationship with this. Yeah, so I think I first heard the album would have been a share house in Brisbane in, I I can't exactly place the year, but I'm going to say 2004, 2005-ish, living with some friends who liked a lot of rock and roll and some of it didn't do a lot for me. Some of it really did. And one of my friends men- mentioned about this band and kind of just said that I would even, like, I would get a lot out of it. And I found the music actually to be really fascinating. And then the backstory I found to be really interesting as well. So I think it's an album that I think sounds incredible and that's how I came into it. But the, the backstory and the weirdness of it all uh, is really fascinating as well. Coming out of nowhere making this one ridiculous album that you know as you mentioned before it's almost like a velvet underground and nico in terms of this far-reaching importance and then the band just implodes and i you know kind of thought a bit over the years that it'd be really fascinating if there was a kind of almost swap with Velvet Underground and Nico, like if the, if Monks did a second album and a third album and a fourth album, like how different would that be? Like you think of V and Nico to White Light, What Heat. A lot of musicians who I really respected, like talked about it a lot as well. And, um, you know, it's a lot of German bands as well and German and electronic musicians. So I've spent some time in Berlin in early 2005, I guess it would have been. And, you know, I was all of 2021 then. It just, it was quite a bit of a sensory overload. So it's kind of the, I had the very low level version of the Monks experience. An American rock band that Germans really loved, that was always going to be kind of interesting to me. Um, Just as an aside, so they had these crazy, these crazy, like, you know, visionary, psychedelic avant-garde German um, management. And um, they were trying to, like the management were trying to get the um, monks to make music for um, their like cola brand and stuff like that. Like they kind of had, there's this, it's Afrocola. It's one of these, there's some like very specific German psychedelic hipster cola brands, which is really weird. Their management was trying to talk them into doing soda commercials. Yeah, for Afrocola. That's wild. I didn't know that. It flips love songs on their head. The fact that there's no hi hat, there's no cymbal sounds pretty much is really interesting as well. Like the kind of, the, there is that. The, the vocal is just so passionate and angry and like yelpy in almost in a way. And then you've got this like drumming, which is kind of really, yeah, it's kind of like Mo Tucker, but it's not so primitive as such. It's more just like rhythmic. Like, and these songs, it's, and I guess we'll go track by track, but it's kind of the, some of these particularly, you don't know when they end. And I really love that it's kind of this, almost this like, super visionary thing but it's also like this old folk music as well where it's not verse chorus it's just there is the song and the song starts and the song ends yeah yes oftentimes they are chants the name of the song might be the only lyric the more you listen to this music the more that style of songwriting becomes not only does it start to make sense it almost starts to feel unnecessarily overblown to include any lyrics except the title of the song. You know, you spend enough time in this territory, that's what happens. So out of curiosity, when I, you know, I can't picture Andrew Tuttle rocking out, what do you reach for when you are in that mood? There's a few different things. So, I mean, something like Monk Monk Time's great. Um, I... I actually like a lot of really trashy like Euro pop as well. So it's kind of the, like, I mean, it's a different mood. Like it's a, this is ridiculous jumping up and down stuff, but um, I do like a lot of trashy Euro pop and I do like a lot of Gabba and stuff like that as well. So that's my kind of part. That's my kind of get up and party music, but. Um, What's Gabba? Um, like hardcore techno. Okay. Like, like very like Dutch, but don, 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 like one eighty BPM. Oh my god, I can't, I can't handle with that at all. <laughs> I mean, I have, I you know, I have a lot of memories in the early nineties of being at raves and, <laughs> and and hearing that music and being like, this is so awesome. Everything except for the music. If only this subset of people 
would uh you know would clamor for something that's you know it doesn't sound like uh you know uh, robots on the nod attempting to have <laughs> sex um that that's what that music does to me it, but uh, you know uh, that's what makes horse racing i suppose it's it's stuff that i think horses courses but I, I i love all that kind of stuff i mean i guess some of the other music i really love and I, this probably relates back more to this album it's kind of it's definitely not close in vibe in terms of politics in terms of culture and everything like that but i think um i really like you know kind of longer form looser things like you know like a lot of afrobeat stuff mm-hmm. as well where it's just you know like you listen to someone like fella kuti and it's just this again you're you're in this hypnotic kind of freight phase and i guess that's music i love the kind of that beat music and yeah, that sometimes is like you this album yeah, the, the, now that you say it you know, I was thinking, you know, you're talking about like, God, how would they have uh, developed over time through album two, three, four, five. And as you were talking, I started thinking about Lester Bang's uh, psychotic reactions and carburetor dung. Uh, have you read the book? I haven't, no. Okay, so the 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 article in particular is a review of the Count Five's psychotic reactions. Most of these garage bands, they have the one album and they're done, just like um, Black, you know, Black Monk time. Mm. But uh, with this particular essay, what's so amazing about it is it gets at the root of what makes us unquenchable, starved music fans. What makes us tear. Yeah. So <clears throat> what it is, is a fake imagining and review of the entire career of Count Five, which never happened. Psychotic Reactions is al- album number one. Carburetor Dung is fake album number two. And he <laughs> just keeps going on this fantasia of, you know, if only these guys had come out with all these records. If the monks had kept going, I think they would have just extended the songs to Felicuti length epics and have like Higgledy Piggledy as an album side length track. Uh, so Monk Time. Now, you know, the difference between this version and the earlier one, now the beat is faster. It's more propulsive. It, it feels like, uh, you know, it's, it's intense. There's an urgency. There's more snarl and bite. Uh, the intro is coming at you in the face with lyrics about his brother dying in the war. And then the organ sounds like a nuclear plant about to blow. Definite differences. It's the difference between asking a question and um, making an order. Like, I think that, you know, that's the previous stuff. It's like the polite, oh, can I, is it okay if I do this? And then the album's like, we are doing this. Right, right. Um, I, I, I do love it. Yeah, it's everything you said. It's that real focus, it's that energy. It's that they've, this is them working out their shit. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it grabs you by the neck. It's it really totally. a great, great intro. Um, then shut up. Uh, shut up is is awesome. I mean, yeah. You don't have songs. I, I don't believe that you have songs like this yet that are in existence uh, within the context of of musical history. I think we're still very. We're, we're obviously very firmly feet planted in "I Love You" territory. But I don't even know if there has been anything that notates a sentiment starkly in opposition to that even if there was it's not it's happening somewhere else in the world where this isn't happening at the same time like if there's coincidentally something else happening it's this isn't informed by it like this is just it's an album informed a band informed by themselves like it's not right. like they're listening to something else with the distortion in you know like america or whatever they're just like they're in their zone they've just they've made this thing and yeah, nothing else that they hear is like it, which is awesome. Like I love on this track, I love like I love on Black Monk Time. It's just this driving rhythm. It's just relentless. And then with um, Shut Up, it's the real the dynamics. I think the, the chorus and the bridge in particular do it for me. But there's it's like these really great dynamics throughout the track. You know, Garage to me it intimates a snottiness. Okay, so yeah. the guitar in Shut Up. It takes the tune straight from, it bypasses Snotty, goes straight to Ferocious. Snotty is just a little bit of teenage suburban attitude. Ferocious yeah. is something completely different. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm hearing here. Boys are boys and girls are choice. First, let's talk about the perfect song title. It's great. And it's interesting that like the earlier version is just called Boys are Boys. Right, like, right. It's just kind of, it's the same lyrics, it's the same 
everything else, but it's just they've kind of just it's a couple of extra words it's the it's the ethos it's just this really interesting thing that came about it like I think it's it's the freneticism of the vocals which really makes it I think it's just that again it sounds urgent it sounds like this three minutes is the most important three minutes in any of their lives to this date which I love and it's just even though it's a fun jaunty song it feels kind of oppressive. When you say, uh, you know, that there's an intensity to it, I mean, they, it's like they can't even do it fast enough. It's almost like Husker Du's Land Speed record. How totally. fast can we play this three-minute song? And then, like, and then the flow into the, um, Higgled, Eye, Higgled Eye, Higgled Eye from there as well. Oh, yeah. That's full-on punk blast. What really stands out in that tune for me is the, the, the organ freakout intro. Totally. I mean, that that just is ripping. I mean, it's on fire. The guitar solo yeah. as well is just absolutely nuts. But what I, what I love about the construction of these songs is that there's no real choruses to speak of. Mm. They're key changes that, that keep ascending and ascending like a ladder into infinity. One of the little notes I had, I put, surf rock is made on the reaper barn so I'm not yeah. sure if you're that aware of the reaper barn but the reaper barn one of the main streets in hamburg and still to this day but particularly i would assume back in the 60s it was like x-rated vegas pretty much like mm -hmm. it's like you know like it's a hamburg's a um like a massive port so it was just kind of there's like a lot of late night clubs there's a lot of sex shops there's a lot of brothels there's a lot of speed going around there's a lot of drinking so it's kind of like if surf rock was being made in vegas in the desert in the german desert in the kind of the forest it was kind of all at once it's just this yeah, ridiculous yeah. it's kind of like the, um the, the it's yeah, such it's displacement like, it's unbelievable yeah totally the, the displaced beach boys almost i hate you is super super forward looking i mean you know oh, there so was... good there were not songs like this at, at this point. It's a really influential song in a slightly different way than the others. So I I kind of, I, I can't imagine a band like Suicide or I can't imagine a singer like Kim Gordon or I can't imagine so many things happening. This kind of almost sultry element that's kind of, there's this, like the vocals at the end of a sort of range, but it's the backing vocals are kind of a like seductive kind of leading you astray kind of thing. And it's just all these really informative musicians in my history my listening history i can't imagine what would have happened without this i mean it's totally revolutionary to just say those words i hate you there's this visceral anger but also this detachment from it as well which i kind of really like there's actually some really amazing covers of it as well the alexander huck from um eisenstein de neubauten has done this amazing cover of it as well it's just like okay well neubauten would have been wouldn't have existed without this and that makes sense i did i had no idea that they did it i would love to hear that the tribute slash cover album is always a bit of a dubious one but um there's this album called silver monk time yeah which silver is, monk time from 2006 yeah. yeah and i think um the I hate I hate you one that's really really great as well and things like the John Spencer and Solex one's just incredible. I know that uh, I know the fall did I hate you. Oh, you know what? I, here's what I was going to ask you. So the utilization of the banjo, how does that, that? You know, I mean, you use the banjo in a much different way than just about everybody on the planet. So does this guy. So uh, um, talk to me about you know how you perceive his his usage of the instrument, seeing as you guys are. Yeah you know, brothers from another mother. <laughs> totally. I think it's incredible. I'm not going to lie and say it's something that I would consider an obvious influence or maybe maybe not even subconscious, but I think it's incredible. And it's the, I, I love the offbeat nature of the banjo. I think when he's playing the banjo offbeat, I think it's really, really fascinating. And it's absolutely affected in a different way that my, than mine is. The banjo is really kind of easy to for it to be out of control sonically. And I think most banjo players, whether it's, it's a very difficult kind of traditional instrument, player, correct? It's a very difficult instrument. And um, I'm, I'm talking about the sound. It's, it's a very difficult sound because it's just, it's all attack, no decay. And uh -huh. um, it's an instrument with its mostly mid-range frequency. So it can kind of get out of control. So for me, with the music I make, a lot of it is trying to rein it rain the actual banjo in so that it still sounds like a banjo but so that it doesn't just sound like mush in the way i'm doing it but with um 
with the monks, it's kind of like it's owning that. It's owning the. It's like it's the owning the overdrive, and I think that's really cool because like you, you think of overdriven bass on the album, you think of overdriven guitar, and that's awesome. But overdriven banjo, like it's really, <laughs> really incredible and really visionary. Okay, so the next song is "Oh How to Do Now." It kind of sounds like mo, like suicide gone Motown. Back on caveman chant territory, just chanting the title over and over again and ratcheting up those key changes for a sort of back of the comic book dramatic effect, and it really works. Absolutely, I think this is probably my favorite song on the album. So that's a big call, <laughs> but it's kind of got that driving beat. Um, the, just the really, it's kind of it's like. It's proto punk. It's whatever. It's also proto club music as well. Like it's just a dunk, 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 dunk. Right, like right. it's really kind of that sixties beat beats almost like, you know, it's getting into like more club focused music where it's about it's about the beat rather than yeah. the the melodies break, but it's just there in the background. And I do like the little solo parts in it as well. Like it's a little bit. Um, and I've got some thoughts about other tracks about later, but I think it, this is on the right side of it's kind of breaking things up a little bit where it's just still got this everyone's got their own little bit and it's it could be cheesy but i think it's actually not in this particular case you know even even if they had done love songs even if the the lyrics had no bite whatsoever if it was defanged completely the sound would put it over uh in such a way that you would imagine all of these lyrics uh, it intimates those lyrics uh and it's a great favorite song i mean this is it's a really really good one. Oh, how to do now is great that's the end of the first side uh kicking off on 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 side b is complication people kill people go to their death for you complication Not a 65 sort of a thought it's so intense for that era and this is the bit where i think of like the time they spent you know, being GIs and stuff, and I don't know if they ever saw battle or anything like that, but it's almost just like, it's the collateral damage of its time. It's just like, oh yeah, people are dying, people are going to the death. This is a complication. Like, I, I feel like this is, it's so biting. It's just like, like, it's, it's dismissive. It's gnarly. It's nasty. It's fantastic. For me, it's where the album should have ended. That's not necessarily dissing the songs afterwards, but we'll go through them. But for me, I think the album should have finished here. I think it would be the most perfect album those seven songs. I, I, I like a short album, but it's like just finishing. It feels weird to f- have tracks after this. Yeah, to have a massive statement and then to just keep going. <laughs> yeah, and then to like, we do, we do, we do, mm-hmm. yeah. we do, we do. Like it's kind of a, yeah. to go through a clever um, English, German wordplay. Yeah. Or at the very least to take that song and just stick it at the end. Because that's my girl is, you know, it, it, again, it's another good song, but but uh, there's there's not the statement that uh, complication makes. Let's do we do, and and this is a weird one where, again, saying that this is one of my favorite favorite albums of all time, and with all the lovely like the pure gushing love I've had for the tracks that um, so far, I kind of don't really dig the next five tracks to various levels but it's kind of like after complication they've gone oh we need to ram it in a bit like mm-hmm. shit like what have we done um so i think this track's still cool like there's this the kind of the yelpy bits are really great um but it kind of yeah and i'm, and I'm just reading things into it that don't exist but it kind of feels like it's plotting a little bit and they're just starting to freak out about what the hell they've done it's like they've ran over the body and they're now just, they've realized how the fuck do we get out of this? You could probably convince me that that is the case with this, and I could probably get with that. Although I think the sequencing has, for me, has more to do with it than a bunch of songs that don't belong on it. For me, it's probably sequencing, but it's more of a splitting of hairs for me. Um, but uh, because I still do love We Do, We Do, it's a hell of a lot more lunk headed in its attack than complication. I do have a question. The strummed banjo under the guitar solo in that song, or just banjo with guitar, the way that they're treating it as a combined effect, had that been done anywhere else in history? I can't imagine on purpose. There's kind of that interplay between the two instruments in folk music, but I think there's, particularly with the distortion on both, I think it's coming out with 
positive unintended consequences. Like, I'm hopefully I'm wrong, and there's people in the comments who can be like, "I oh, actually this was done beforehand," and hell yeah, keep <laughs> always keep it corrected. But yeah, I don't know. It's just the way that it's done. It's kind of the it's trying to figure out happy accidents. I think it's just the fact that like working in early days with overdriven instruments, while you try, while people are trying to experimenting with these sounds, there's going to be like amps broken and there's going to be valves and there's going to be weird shit that happens. And I think that's where some of those kind of happen. It's kind of the happy studio accidents that the music's tight, but it's just, it might be that a, a, a speaker's blowing halfway through a take or something like that where these yeah, kind yeah. of things, are, oh, cool. this, is, this is unexpected. The next track in the series of hated Andrew Tuttle Monk songs is Love Came Tumbling Down, or actually, it's Drunken Maria, but I know you don't. You're not a huge fan of that one. I like the drums on it, and I really like the like the Maria, where it's just the Maria, and mm. it's the Yelp and the twang underneath. That's really, really incredible. Um, I put for my negative notes the organ sounds like the Doors. Um, I fucking hate the Doors, so that was kind <laughs> of a, that. That was a negative one, and I put for my notes in this, and I, I like Sleeping Maria, but I put. This is the this is like that scene in the Kurt and Courtney film where Nick Bloomfield realizes he's run out of money. <laughs> like we've run out of money and we've got to finish off an album. Love came tumbling down. I love. It's one of my favorites. I know it exists in this chunk of songs toward the end where you don't connect with as much, but um, I love the dumbass progression to it. It's so stupid and so beautiful that strident march to nowhere. <laughs> And this more so possibly than anything on the record has that Mo Tucker two years before Mo Tucker sound. This one feels to me like a perfect synthesis of their earlier shadows imbued work and their new, more aggressive stance. In this track, it's almost like there's three or four songs in one. Like it's really, it's almost like a showreel of all the things mm -hmm. they can do. It's interesting, there's some cool bits to it, but they're, like, they're trying to do too many things at once. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I feel like it's a, it's a bit unfocused. This one I really do love. I would say that it doesn't make a sort of countercultural imprint. It's not as important, let's say. For me, a great one. I don't have as much to say about Blast Off or That's My Girl. I do believe Blast Off should have been the first song they played for the moon landing. I think I was just annoyed that it had so much ride symbol. Like, it's like, come on, guys, mm -hmm. you've done this. You've been so good at, you've been so good at um, putting it away. It would have been the greatest of the songs on the earlier recordings. But because it's on this particular album, it's weak. Here, here's my notes on it, okay? So not a single yeah. bad song on the entire record, for starters. And then as a whole, forget about the songs themselves or their beguiling and idiosyncratic structures. As a whole, this thing is a fucking stick of dynamite thrown right into the goddamn asshole of music history. It's totally. one of the most important and greatest albums ever made. It came before everyone that you thought created punk rock everyone maybe except for the kinks other than that everyone this is a must-have if you care about music at all and i give it five stars absolutely i would 100 percent agree and it's that thing where just because i don't like all the tracks doesn't mean it's not an incredibly important and rewarding album like i think a lot of my favorite albums have tracks that i don't care for and that's fine i think that's really an interesting part of it it's interesting to see people's journey and where they're coming from so like do you really I, think it's five stars though or do you personally feel like the, in terms of its importance it's five stars in terms of musically where it's at for me it's i would go four and a half okay, I would that's put, what i thought yeah I, I would put the first seven tracks are like just they're they're almost over they're almost 110 percenting it's not scientifically possible to go over that but and even with the other tracks, the ones that I don't like, the whole length of the album is 30 minutes. I think four and a half. Let's go with that. Yeah, I think that's more true to you. Because honestly, just because this has, you know, ramifications for the development of music, you know, the people that I asked to be on the show, they own their space on the shelf of music history. By no means do you have to hew or skew to those opinions. Yours mean a hell of a lot more to me than a textbook. The way I got into music and stuff like that, it's, it's I think I've missed a lot of the rock canon, but I think this album is incredible and it really stands apart in a lot of ways. And, and I think it's visionary. It's, it is worth noting that The Fall has covered four of the songs on the record. I That's Hate so You wild. and How to and Oh How to Do Now are on their 1990 album Extricate. Shut Up is on uh, Middle Class Revolt from 94 and Higgledy Piggledy on Dag As They Do on Silver Monk Time. To, to release 
a third of someone else's album over 15 years like that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just like is it is it just marky smith just forgetting that he did it like you know and there's no and there's no one to tell him because yeah. he, he sacked the whole band it three times in that time the month that the record comes out polydor also releases in march 66 a single of complication with oh how to do now on the flip again that that tanks and over the next year or so throughout six the rest of 66 and into 67, uh, they start to change their musical direction. So this is a turning mm. point for the band. Do you know what happened during this time? I kind of that turning point, turning point was just they went on tour. They really tried pushing this angle and it didn't work. And um, from there, the management kind of did a hard turn. The label did a hard turn from you should be the visionary, amazing thing to how about you be some kind of softer music? And the band were doing these, well, well, some of the band put some new songs in. So there was like, I Can't Get Over You. And there was Cuckoo, which are these kind of just songs. They kind of just, it's yeah. this definite different angle. It's, I mean, there's a track called, you know, it's a pretty big wig flash from I Hate You to I Can't Get Over You. Um, right, yeah, right, and I, think right. I, think, I think they've just, they've freaked out. They're tired. They've freaked out. The people who are putting money in to realize they're not getting money. The record came out, they had press events, photo shoots, they had a six month tour of one nighters and music halls and bars uh, across West Germany. Unfortunately, the tour wound up being totally debilitating for the band. Can you imagine? Can you imagine just being like the mid 60s? You hear this band, this American band, and you're thinking, you know, it could be an uh, American band doing the beat invasion that's kind of be thinking oh this will be like the you know beaters or this will be like the yardbirds or this this will be this fun little thing on a um like on a Saturday night at the local dance down in Stuttgart or Ulm or you know Bremen or whatever and then you right. get this you get these right. guys in hessian sacks who shave their heads and are playing angry music yeah and so because of that i don't think it was too difficult for their management to talk them into other, <laughs> other routes and you know it's safe to say that from whatever kind of situation you're in right now i'm sitting on my hotel floor in between my two beds in my in my underwear at four in the morning recording this uh and you're in the safe harbor of where you are <clears throat> these guys must have been kind of freaking out a little bit at least oh, totally. a little bit um the album didn't do anything and mm. their manager was urging them to capitalize on the popularity of soft wave music that that's yeah. that's how it was described in wikipedia soft wave so i i honestly don't even know what that is but he was particularly championing the the beatles song yellow submarine which is weird how do you go from black monk time to hey i think there's something here in a beatlesque novelty song going from innovating to chasing trends which is right. just doesn't work and most innovators to be fair they go from you know doing something that's groundbreaking you know then there's a ton of acolytes who are inspired and churn out amazing stuff and then that initial band is inspired by those bands. But this tale unfurled so quickly that we fast forwarded right to the end. There's no bands that were inspired. And then the re-inspiration, that didn't happen. Instead, we had the manager who thought he was on to a great idea. Uh, we have the majority of the band, to their credit, resisting that idea in favor of protecting Ooh. their image. But Dave Day was the guy. Dave Day utilized what he saw as an opportunity to introduce a love song to the rest of the monks, a song called Cuckoo. When the band returned to Hamburg for their second residency at the Top 10 Club, they recorded Cuckoo along with I Can't Get Over You. And thus we enter phase two, so sad to watch good punk go bad, 1966. <laughs> To 1967. This is the thing you can't trust banjo players. Dave 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 just comes, gets an idea to write a song, ruins it for everyone. Um, and I just, I, I love. So, are you across the German term Schlager music? So essentially, it's just like it's cheesy pop music. There's kind of there's a certain style to it, but it's cheesy, sentimental, like um, flash in the pan pop music. And it's really interesting that they've the Beatles, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the monks went from this visionary thing to like, let's get the cheesiest of cheesy things. Like, it's just really, it's the bit, and I, I've, there's so much German music I love, but there's also so much cheesy stuff as well. Like, they're kind of doing the, like, the Americans doing Schlager. It's like, 
I guess you could say one positive about this stuff. They were the proto David Hasselhoff in their later right. era. So in, in that they've gone from proto punk to proto Hoff. Right. For I better for better or for what, worse. Did you just call that a positive thing? Whether positive or otherwise. Um, <laughs> you've, got, you've gone from proto punk to proto Hoff. So that's 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 the new genre we've made up today. What a generous gentleman you are. <laughs> <laughs> a true gentleman. Uh, I, I I will say that, that I do prefer David Hasselhoff to I Can't Get Over You. Big call, but we're making it. Not me. Not me. <laughs> I actually, look, this stuff, if you take away Black Monk time and the band started here, or if you just had the early stuff and then they just skipped over the revolutionary part of their sound, Cuckoo, not the greatest song of all time. It's actually the first tune by them that chronologically that I'm not entirely wild about. Mm. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the instrumental interplay later in the song, but lyrically, it's down there with fucking Herman's Hermits. Someone took my cuckoo. Do you know who, who? My wife, Jen, said it sounds like Adam Ant, which I think is high praise, all things considered. <laughs> totally. Um, it's not terrible. I, I give it two and a half. Yeah, yeah it's just, it, it's an interesting, like, historical curiosity of a band at that time. It actually worked. I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, the this single uh, charted in some German markets. Did you <laughs> this, know that? this is again. This is again. I didn't, and this is also the country that made David Hasselhoff a thing and brought about Crazy Frog and killed six million Jews. <laughs> yeah, I think I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Don't worry, I'm going to cut yeah. that. What do you give this? What do you, what do you, do you like this I'm, one at all? Or? I'm going to give this two. I'm not a fan. I think okay. it's something I wouldn't listen to if it wasn't this particular group so around this time the monks learned that polydor would not be distributing black monk time in the states and the guys were persuaded to incorporate kind of subtle psychedelic rock flourishes into their third single under the expectation that it could theoretically expand their dwindling audience right. they're flailing the rudder yeah is gone. yeah there's totally. no direction anymore um mm. and i don't know if you know this i kind of love this uh, only because of how you know pathetic it sounds, but their dumbass sounding management team kept trying to boost their spirits by reiterating their ultimate goal of releasing two more albums called Silver Monk Time and Gold Monk Time to boost their egos. Wow. Yeah, so... that's a real thing. So April 1967, the potential indignities of a latter day career for a nascent band in a in an as yet undiscovered subgenre of music <laughs> it comes to a thankfully swift end with this with this single here uh, in april 1967 love can tame the wild and on the flip he went down to the sea so they made tentative moves to change their sound on this dave day's signature banjo gone uh burgers frantic vocals gone Spangler's keyboards gone, replaced by a rhythm guitar, subdued singing, and very calculated orchestration, you know, wildly inappropriate orchestration. I mean, it's like a total fucking mess. Will Bedard, who's a monk historian, uh, aptly described the single as as uninspired as the LP was revolutionary. Totally. Yeah, it's just forgettable, and it's there's nothing to it. It's just, it's like... It's kind of, again, it's just that trend chasing and flailing around without any other, other ideas. And like, it's just this management. But, but this like, is the worst of the worst. In, in oh, a way totally. That, yeah, yeah. And actually, in an ass backwards kind of way, it makes it fascinating. I mean, the A side, Love Can Tame the Wild, is a dildo in the ass of credibility for this band. <laughs> it is their, totally, like, yeah. it, it's their Jefferson Starship period in one song. Um, totally. But although bad, I cannot find it within myself to slam them for this. They had to freak out for having gone too far in an experimental direction that no audience would cotton to. So they tried to connect and it killed the band, but it did it quickly. Yeah, they've just been broken at that point where they just, they've got this man, they've got these managers who are just aggressively pushing them into different ideas. And it's kind of, it's like, you can feel just- Well, I mean, look at Velvet Underground had Steve Sesnick, the manager, after Warhol, obviously. You know, after Lou wound up leaving the band, he tried to keep it going. I, I don't know if you've heard Squeeze. Yeah. Okay. So to me, 
as a music fan, that kind of stuff is endlessly interesting. For someone who just likes music, uh, you know, there could be nothing less interesting. The A side has all of the earmarks of, you know, a group acting in a way completely counter to who they were at heart, which caused the death of the band. And mm. it didn't cause it, it sort of earmarked it as uh, an externalization of all the elements that were already, had already killed the band. So the B-sides, I think, a tiny bit better, but we're splitting hairs here. I mean, He yeah. Went Down to the Sea is as bad a, a, a title of a song as Boys Are Boys and Girls Are Choice is a great title. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's, in fact, it's back to that as uninspired as revolutionary that you mentioned before. Also, what in the fuck is up with that shit trumpet solo? It's like <laughs> the worst trumpet solo I have ever heard in my life. It's so bad. I'm being really nice here, but I'm going to give this single two stars. I'm going to go one. I, and that one is feeling empathy for the band because I think they were being put in a very difficult position by their managers. So that's mm -hmm. that's the one. It's it's a one out of a we've all signed a bad contract kind of thing like that. So, right, right. But yeah, it's pretty irredeemable. So in May 67, they were performing with, uh, with Hendrix, with the experience, and the tension kept ratcheting up and up among the group. Dave Day became increasingly irritated and annoyed by the, the covers that were being added to the live set of the band. And Berger and Johnston abandoned the monk image in favor of colorful clothing. Did you know that? <laughs> I did, and I'm did, just. A... I didn't know that until this, but the, in six, in May '67, they were draping themselves in psychedelic finery, despite the fact that the band was pulling itself into little pieces by this point. Mm. Uh, they were still scheduled to depart for Vietnam to do an upcoming tour because that's where all the best tours were going down in Vietnam <laughs> in 1967. Just a day before the flight, Berger had informed the band that Clark had returned to his hometown uh, back in Texas. And Johnston, who had read about Buddhist monks that immolated themselves by setting themselves on fire, he believed now that the, the monks were going to meet a similar fate at the hands of the Viet Cong. So the group is <laughs> splintering so to pieces. <laughs> He left in September 1967. The group broke up. This is just turning into that thing you do. Yeah. By now. Yep. Like it's just, it's kind of, I'm just imagining Tom Hanks as like an avant garde German manager, which is pretty funny. But it's just, it's, I just, this is where it's turning to like parody of itself. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But there was one other recording. I don't know if you know that um, during the same sessions on February 28th, 1967, that garnered. Uh, Love Can Tame the Wild, and He Went Down to the Sea. There were five other songs that were recorded, which later yeah. came out as an EP called Hamburg Recordings 1967. Yeah, so, I, I found that yeah. one to be, I, I made some notes about that. I kind of gave it a two to two and a half because it's, it's got some interesting bits, but um, it's, I, I just find it to be kind of, why does this exist it's kind of it's it's got some interesting elements in it but it's definitely scraping the barrel and very unfocused i think it's better than the single but again that's not saying much yeah yeah so the, just to explain this release so i'm watching you uh would have been recorded on the same day as the two songs on the single the remaining mm -hmm. four songs there's five total were recorded after hours in the top 10 club later that year just prior to the breakup of the band in the summer of 67. it's without the ferocious intensity of black monk time and the songs they pretty closely resemble typical pop tunes of the era yeah rather than the monks most extreme compositions dave day's banjo is low in the mix mm. and while there's a certain amount of the band and what they do that shines through ultimately this captures the sound of the band trying to play nice. Again, it's that thing of like, they've just gone so far ahead on this album that they're almost like shell-shocked from themselves. I would imagine that my rating for this is a little controversial because no one digs anything except for Black Monk Time. But in any case, I enjoy this fucking thing. It sounds like you feel the same way. I think that they really, really should have stayed together and seen where this thing took them. For Hamburg recording, it's five tracks. Three are pretty solid. Those three are I'm Watching You, P.O. Box 3291, and I Need You, Shotzi. 
I give it three stars. Okay, I'm gonna go. To, I think I said two and a half to, like okay. two, to, two. But two, I'm gonna go two and a half. It could have been cool to see if they'd maybe found more of themselves again. Like there's, yeah, yeah there's bits of it. I think I put for PO Box three two nine one. That was the one I rated the highest. PO Box three two nine one. It has like very similar scaffolding as earlier tunes mm. that they would produced. Just two rotating chords and an arresting enough melody at the core. It just doesn't. It doesn't deliver the knockout punch of their best shit. It's an interesting yeah. track, though, because it hews a hell of a lot closer to their punk template than the rest of the cornball material that came yeah. through. But my favorite on this is I'm Watching You. I'm Watching mm. You is actually my favorite post-Black Monk Time track. And then the other one, I Need You Shotzi. No one in their right mind would get in the mood to hear the monks and then reach for that. But it's still yeah. it's still pretty good. Let's talk about uh, what's gone on since the band broke up. Just a few yeah. uh, a few things that have happened uh, in 1994. Eddie Shaw published an autobiography called Black Monk Time. The the album's been reissued on CD since the 90s, and bonus tracks were included on the Light in the Attic records release in 2009. Uh, Lenny K featured Complication on the expanded reissue of Nuggets something that Mr. Tuttle probably knows nothing about since snotty garage punk is not <laughs> in this man's wheelhouse. It's not. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the first track of 13th Floor Elevators and then I'm pretty much clueless after that. Hey, not a bad one to have. It kind of trumps totally. all the rest of them. So the tribute album Silver Monk Time came out in October 2006 and that was the soundtrack actually to the documentary Transatlantic Feedback. In the title of the documentary, the Transatlantic Feedback, like I think they're one of those groups that are really interesting, particularly German and American back and forth. I think in terms of music where there's so much amazing music from one country inspires the other and so on and so on. So you know, I, I think it's this, this band from Amer this band of Americans who form and become a band shaped by Germany who then influence Americans who influence Germans and so on and so on. So I think it's a really nice little touch that uh, tribute album because it shows their reach as a band and where and how they influence people. The relationship I have with your music, I was reading Mojo Magazine, a magazine out of England about an Australian banjo player. I was in California at the time. I drove to Vermont and had a transcendent emotional experience after all of these geographical components had been mixed up in this giant cauldron. Um, totally. So yeah, a band like this, the mark of their success is not in dollars and cents. When Velvet Underground came out, it was about how many bands were started as a result, right? So for these guys, it's, you know, trying to track countless bands that were infected and affected by this music. These guys did actually in November 99, to coincide with the release of Five, of five Upstart Americans, uh, the Monks with a vocalist named Mike Fornatali, uh, they reformed the headline Cave Stomp, uh, which was their first performance in the US 32 years after the group broke up. Amazing. Uh, so that was actually released on a live album called Let's Start a Beat, live from Cave Stomp. We're not going to rate that or talk about it really, just, just kind of a mention. The original Monks lineup performed together for the very last time at the Rock Around event in Las Vegas in 2004. Uh, later in the year, Johnston died in November from lung cancer. Reunions then in England and Germany in 2006 and 2007 before the band officially disbanded. On January 10th, 2008, Dave Day died from a massive heart attack at the age of 66, presumably while listening to Cuckoo. Berger began a solo career thereafter, performing mostly with the Monks repertoire until 2009. And then Berger, who'd oddly been the mayor of a tiny town uh, in Minnesota called Turtle River since 2007, uh, he died of cancer. Let's talk about the overview and shape of their arc. Uh, yeah, something I, I love to do because you know it's a it's a a short discography, but you get a very clear sense of what happened to them. So totally, Black Monk Time was described in the mid '90s by the great Julian Cope of of the Teardrop Explodes as a lost classic. Um, he writes, "No one ever came up with a whole album of such dementia." The Monk's Black Monk Time is a gem born of isolation and the horrible deep down knowledge that no one is really listening to what you're saying. Mm. I think they were perfect. 
the essence of what they represented just wasn't happening anywhere else on the planet, let alone in Germany. It seems like they figured they were making a loud enough wall of noise that between that and the language barrier, that no one would even know what they were singing about. But it crept its way overseas, and people did hear. The monks make the Velvet Underground look like One Direction. Such are the depths of obscurity in which they dwell. They were just too perfect and pristine to continue for long, like a chrysalis enshrouded in eternity. Only a couple limp, half-hearted grabs for pop recognition snuff their thing for good. But there's always time for Black Monk time. My top three records. Number three, Hamburg Recordings, 1967. Number two, the early years comp. Number one, obviously, Black Monk time. The worst release by them, unquestionably, April 1967 single, Love Can Tame the Wild, backed with He Went Down to the Sea. I would agree on all of that. I concur with the ratings and everything. I think it's a really, what I also like about them is that they have this capsule in time musically and also historically as well, where I think, um, if they lasted an extra year, they would have actually become back in the moment again with, you know, I think all the um, riots in 1968, whether it's the Paris mm -hmm. ones, whether it's the Eastern European ones, whether it's um, in America, the Democratic Co Convention ones as well. Right. I, I like how this thing existed for so, such a short amount of time. It even had burnt out by what could have been its time. I find it really interesting right. that it was just, it was too provocative and too visionary um, even for its moment. I do like the fact that you can have this thing and you can just imagine what would have happened, but you haven't had 30 years of various tours and reunion things to know what happened. Like it's, a, again, going back to the Velvet Underground, it's the, the various directions all of them went in, for better and worse, but it's fascinating yeah. that. But it would have been interesting and not, not better, but interesting if what happened if that band stopped existing at a certain point or with monks like what would have I mean, what would have gary Berger's lou reed tai chi era be like <laughs> or what what would dave day making pop albums with her a la john Cale, or who would be the who would be the monks as um doug yule i'm like all these things like that like i love the idea of like having you can kind of it's almost like fanfic in a way but you know you can be like yeah. well, this is what it was it was that capsule which is cool all right, that about does it. Thanks for joining us. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, Patreon superstar and chief of staff, Corbin Betleon, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Andrew Tuttle, and the entire Soldier of Sound Patreon community. I love you, and frankly, this show would not exist without you. Be sure to stay tuned, because this Tuesday brings upon us another incredible episode of The Private Press with Paul Major, wherein you'll be introduced to a whole new world of music there's little chance you've either heard or heard of before. And then there's this Thursday's wildcard episode as well. Of course, you'll also want to tune in a week from today for a soul-bearing interview with Foxygen's Jonathan Rado, right here in the place to which you come to say, throw on a winter jacket and bolt through the black ice thousands of miles across this great land that celebrates democracy at its very core. I've got the greatest son that ever was, and he knows it because this is my legacy to my best friend, Mason. Stay gold, mother uppers. It's discography. <laughs>